All right, welcome back to Way of the Wrench and another episode of How to Become a Welder. On this very special episode, we're gonna use some of those gas welding skills and I'm gonna show you how to make a little cool project where you can make chainmail rings to make chainmail armor with. And we're also gonna talk about a new weld joint called the fillet and some other tips and tricks that are used in the steel fab industry. So grab a root beer and stay tuned. When you think of welding projects, you tend to think of welding a bunch of pieces together to make one part or your final product. But welding can also be used for making tools or a jig or a fixture that's going to make other parts. And that's what today's project is. We're going to be making a chainmail ring making jig. Now, first question is, what's chainmail? Well, this is a chainmail ring. Now, on its own, it's pretty useless, but if you make a ton of them, you can start weaving them together in a pattern and you can make kind of cool products, such as a chainmail hacky sack, which is one of my students' favorites projects to make. It's also a very good beginner project to learn about patterns and weaving, and uh, it's actually a really good hacky sack. Uh, I've also had students do kind of um, chainmail jewelry, and some of them that get right into it and want to put the time and effort um, actually start making some chainmail armor, so really quite cool stuff. But you can't do any of this without chainmail rings, and to do these and make a ton of them really quickly, you need a chainmail making jig. And that's what we're making today. All right, so before we start welding up our chainmail ring making jig, it's important to note that you are able to weld this jig with any kind of welder you have. You don't have to have a gas welder. However, I am showing it with a gas welder because we just have done a bunch of info about gas welding. I thought I'd make a project for that. And the other thing is we have to do some nice precision bends in our handle for our, the mandrel for the project. And I'm gonna be showing you how to do that with a gas welding and putting some heat so you get some nice bends. So. Use what you have at home, you can make this jig. In order to make this project exactly how I have it in the video, you're gonna need some materials. And what I used was a one inch by one inch square tube. Doesn't really matter what thickness it is, but for what I'm using, I'm using 0.1 wall thickness or 100 thousandths. Then for the mandrel and the handle, you're gonna need some solid round bar. Uh, in this video, I used 3 8 outside diameter, and that will give you a certain size chainmail ring. So if you want something smaller or bigger, you can always change the size of this and the holes in the jig. Now, if you don't have these exact materials at home, but you have something different in your metal rack, go ahead and use that. I'm sure it'll work out just as fine. All right, let's go cut some metal. Keep in mind, if you don't have all this fancy equipment at home, we're just cutting metal. So whether it's with a grinder or a chop saw or even just a hand hacksaw, you can cut the metal, you can do the project. And to prove my point, I'm going to cut this 3 8 with the hacksaw as well. And with any kind of metal project, when you've cut your materials, they're all sharp, they've got lots of burrs on them. So take a quick minute, grab a file, deburr them before you continue. And while you're at it, why don't you kind of take off that mill scale around, probably about half an inch or an inch away from the edge of where you're gonna weld.
All right, so the next step in the project is taking our operate pieces and we have to drill a hole through there so that we can fit our mandrel through the top and have it line up and be able to spin and make our chainmail rings. Now that hole has to be pretty accurate, otherwise you'll have trouble fitting it to the second post. So what I recommend you do is you make one end a reference edge. So the end here where it's gonna to weld to the base piece, where I've taken the mill scale off, this is gonna be my reference edge. And from that edge, I wanna go up seven inches, make a line, and then a nice line right in the center of this for my hole. And I'm gonna do the same thing for both pieces from this reference edge. So now that we've got this hole laid out and ready to be drilled, remember we gotta do the same exact thing on this part. So I thought this would be a great moment for me to talk about a steel fabricator's tip that I know about. So whenever you are making multiple pieces that have the same exact hole in the same exact location, you can take the pieces, line them up with a reference edge or edges, and when they're all clamped, you lightly tack them together on both ends, and then when you do your drilling, you drill through all the pieces, and then they're all in the same spot and the same diameter, and all you gotta do is grind the light tack welds off, break it free, maybe take a file to whatever little burrs left over, and now you have all your pieces with the same hole in the same exact spot, which is what we kind of need. Now, they also kind of use this technique when they are mass producing things. So I'll give you an example. If you had an order for 10,000 one inch square washers, you could take one inch flat bar and take 10 lengths of it, line them all up on the end, MIG weld the end so they're all welded together, and then when you put it in the saw, you measure out accurately the first one, one inch, make a stop, do your cut, and then every time you just have to move it up, all 10 lengths, up to your stop, clamp it, cut it, and it's a quick way of doing work nice and accurately. So we're gonna do that with these pieces. Okay, so as opposed to normal welding where we want really good penetration, I want to be able to take this tack off and not have to grind a whole bunch to get this to separate. So I just want to get the surfaces kind of wet and then put a little tack, kind of make it kind of almost like a cold tack where it's lumpy and then that'll be easy to grind off later. I'm going right in the center so there's no kind of warping or distorting. There we go, there's one end. Once you've got both ends tacked, you don't need the clamps anymore. You can take them off and then we're gonna go and drill that hole. So I've got a drill bit gauge here to figure out what size the drills are. And here's my 3 8 rod. Now, if I drill it a 3 8 hole, it's basically a size to size fit and this isn't gonna to wanna to go in. And if it did, it's not gonna to wanna to spin nice. So I recommend you go 1 64th higher, in this case, which is 25 64th. That way it goes through and we'll be able to spin that up. Now when you mount your piece in the vise, make sure that the hole where it's gonna drill all the way through to the bottom isn't drilling into the bottom of your vise. And usually there's a spot in the center where it can clear. Make sure you put it there. Always a good idea to clamp your vise to the table so nothing moves on you, and I'm gonna use a C-clamp. So I always get that ready and then um, not tighten it yet and get it kind of lined up with my center punch. I know it's gonna drill exactly where I want it, then tighten it and double check it's in the right place. A really good way of checking if it's in line is spinning it counterclockwise. So it doesn't wanna cut, but it kind of follows into the center punch mark that you made.
Always not a bad idea to put a little bit of lubrication to help with the friction and the heat. As you're drilling here, always take little cuts as opposed to just keeping it going through the whole piece and making long, dangerous spiral chips. And uh, make sure you have your safety glasses when you do this. Always let that thing come to a complete stop before you get in there and start cleaning or take your material out. All right, so now that we have that hole drilled through these, we're just gonna grind down those tacks flush with the original surface on both ends, and then we're gonna hammer it apart. And there should be very little strength in there because I just made a cold little tack weld. So let's do that. Right, now that you got those tack welds ground down, hold one side in the vise, get a nice big hammer and hit it nice and hard and that'll just bust off. Now there is a little bit of burr, you just knock it off real quick with a file and then you're good to go. So now that we got these separated and the end filed off the burrs, we do have a little bit of a burr that's on these holes. So another quick little tip, if you're not looking for a perfect chamfer, you just want to get that burr off, grab a bigger size drill, like quite substantially bigger, and just even by your hand, just turn it and that'll take that burr off. All right, so every project's a little different, but they all have the same basic premise. We want to get these pieces set up exactly how you want them for the final product, and we're going to tack weld them so they can hold that position, and that way when we go to weld this, they don't move and warp as the weld starts to shrink. And if there's any problems where things are not lined up, when it's in the tack weld, all you got to do is grind it, knock it off, and start all over. That way you know this project's going to be perfect. Now, magnets are a great way to keep your parts in place and nice and flush and square. So I've got a bunch of the magnets holding them together in the right spots. And I'm going to tack weld the outside here and the outside here, and then I'll take the magnets off and see how everything looks. All right, so the reason why I'm welding on this end here is that the surfaces are kind of flush together as opposed to a true fillet where it's like a 90 degree corner. And I find that when you're tack welding, if you tack on this flat, flush surface, it doesn't pull as much. Whereas if I had started on the opposite side, uh, that fillet tack weld tends to pull a lot more. So I'm doing this one first. Okay, and then I'm gonna do this the other side. Right, so now that we have these tack welded on the ends here, we took the magnets off. It's time to check if these are exactly where we want them. Now, one of the first things I always check for is, is this square? Because remember, as this tack weld shrinks, it's gonna pull the piece over. So I fully expect to have a little bit of a gap at the top here when I put the square in. So put the square flat, slide it over to the edge and look for a light gap. Now, in this case, it's actually pretty good. So I'm not even gonna to touch it. And this side is even better so it really hasn't moved that much however if there was a big gap and i needed to correct that get your hammer hammer it in the direction that you need it to so that you can see no light between the square and then that's nice and square now not only do you have to worry about this way you also have to worry about this direction as well so make sure that it's straight with your edges on that side as well now sometimes depending where you lay your tack you might even have the part kind of twist a little bit if that ever happens you get yourself a big crescent wrench that way you can kind of fit it over your part and then you can literally kind of twist and pull in whatever direction it needs to go. So whenever I'm tack welding a part in place, I generally use four tacks, one for each of the sides to hold it all in place so that when I weld it, it's not going to move. So I've got my first tack weld done. I've already checked to make sure I'm nice and square and straight and it's where I need it. So the next tack weld, I always put it on the opposite side because it's not going to move as much because this one is now holding it in place. Then I do a final check, make sure it's square this way, and then I do the third and fourth tack. So 
I'm gonna go ahead and do all these on both sides and I'll show you what it looks like. Now with this one inch square tube, I'm putting this tack weld right in the middle of it as opposed to one side. That way it's not gonna be trying to twist the part. I just want it to be able to hold it in the one direction. Make sure you're putting even heat on both pieces. So now that these pieces are tacked into place, this is the last time to check and make sure these are exactly where you want them. Otherwise, once you start welding, it's a lot more work to fix. So check if they're square on all four sides. Make sure your mandrel spins in there nice and you're good to go. Now, I'm gonna find a nice place to set this so that I can actually comfortably weld it and get a good position for the camera. And now we're gonna start doing some fillet welds. All right, so same reason why I started tacking on this flush end. Uh, I'm gonna weld this side up first because it's gonna pull less if it wants to pull. So I'm gonna start right at the corner here. I gotta get some heat. Get my puddle, it's going liquid now. Add some material there. And start making my way across. Now, because I have some material with my tack, I kind of have to regulate how much filler rod I'm adding, otherwise I'm gonna end up with an extra lump there. But I don't wanna just skip it either. I wanna go right over the tack, that way I kind of hide it as I go here. And try to go as far as you can over to the corner, make sure you don't leave a crater, put some material. And that's one side done. Okay, so off camera, I've just flipped it to the other side, so we're gonna do the same thing. Well, the one side that's flush on the outside. Okay, surface is going shiny. Add some furler rod, fill up that puddle before I start moving. And start making my way across. Once again, kind of melt in with my tack, regulate how much I'm adding, but don't skip the tack, go over it. That way you can kind of try to hide it. Okay, make sure you deposit all the way to the end. There we go. All right, so onto the fillet weld. And a fillet weld is anytime when you're welding something that's got 90 degrees uh, angle between the two pieces. So, gotta get the corner in here, get some heat. And I am welding at a super awkward angle to try to get a good angle for you guys for viewing. And uh, it's making it very challenging, so we'll just see how this goes. So I'll start at one end, put some heat in there, make sure the surfaces go shiny. So one of the disadvantages of gas welding is that it is a slower process. You can see that. We're going to wait here, get some heat in here. And the other option is getting a hotter welding tip, but then I might be too hot for my actually welding. So gas welding is a bit slower. All right, surfaces start to go shiny here.
Alright, time to add some filler rod. Okay, watch the top and bottom edges of your puddle. Make sure that they're even as you go across. Make sure you got no holes here. Same thing with your old tack weld. Go over it, but don't add too much more material, otherwise it'll just look like a big lump. And if your puddle seems a little hollow, add some more filler rod. Get some material in there. you got to slow down. Make sure that puddle is connecting both pieces. as you can before it starts kind of turning the angle. Make sure you don't leave a crater, make sure you leave some material there. there Alright, so this is the second side. Off camera, I just flipped it around. Man oh man, is there a fine balance between getting a good angle for you guys to see what's going on and for me to be able to see. You ultimately need to have exactly my vision and I'm trying to replicate it with the best of my abilities so hopefully this picks it up. So with these fillet welds, when you're gas welding or TIG welding, you can generally kind of leave the torch angle at about 45 degrees, so right in between the two, and just kind of tilt the angle of the torch depending where you think you need the heat needs to be by watching the color. But uh, if you're ever doing fillets with MIG or stick, you tend to have to kind of have an angle more towards facing the upright vertical piece because the weld bead tends to fall down a bit. So it falls from a 45 degree angle and it kind of falls towards the bottom. Enough to kind of help push up the weld and keep it up, or if it sags down, it ends up at 45 degrees. But I find with gas welding and TIG, since you are heating the puddle in exact spots, you kind of have more control over that. All right, surface is going liquid. Add some rod. There's our puddle. Make sure it's even between the two. Start moving slowly over. Try to have a little bit of an angle so it can preheat ahead of you. It's kind of got cold here again, so I'm just gonna pause, give it a little bit more heat. Okay, go right over our tack. Watching the top and the bottom of my weld bead. Trying to make sure they're the same so there's an even amount of weld on both pieces. Make sure I don't leave a crater at the end here. All right, now with these side welds here, I want to tie in that last weld bead, otherwise I end up kind of with some kind of interruption in the weld bead. So I've gone over the last end of the last bead. Got a slight angle on my torch, so I'm preheating ahead of me. right over the tack weld. Watch the height of my weld be behind me, make sure I'm adding enough material. If it looks looking flat, add some more. And then when I get to the other corner here, I'm gonna have to kind of angle my torch and try to tie it into the fillet weld bead pass that I did on the inside. And then I 
So now that we've got this frame all welded up and our mandrel spins nicely in here, no issues that way, we have to figure out where we're gonna put our bands and use the heat to do that. So I've got this in here lined up. I've got about an inch overlap, that way it doesn't just kind of pull off the end when we're making our rings. And probably about the same there. So I'm just gonna mark that with a Sharpie. And let's bend this down at 90 degrees and I'll show you how we do that. Now in order to bend the 90 degree angles on our crank, there's a couple options of how you want to do this. You get a vise and a really large hammer and you can start smacking the crap out of it until you get the angle you want, but not really a great way of doing it because you're going to end up with a whole bunch of hammer marks, probably a hard crease right at the top of the vise when you do that as well. And if you are going to do that route, try to hit right above where the vise is. That way you get a bend there. If you hammer closer up to the top, you tend to bend a larger radius on it, and that's not what we're looking for. So that's option number one. However, because we're doing oxyacetylene gas welding, we're going to use the torch, and I'm going to show you option two, which makes a way nicer, smoother radius, and nice tight bends too, depending on how you apply the heat. So let's do that. All right, the trick for applying the heat is we only want to do it in one band, and we want to do it all the way around. So you can kind of get one side starting to glow red, and then kind of hop over to the other side. The trick is to have it all the same heat all the way around. We're kind of looking for kind of a, a bright orange. We don't want to melt it, but we do want the heat in there so it'll be nice and easy for us to bend. Now I do have a tiny little machinist square ready here too. And there we go, there's my one little single band. If I, if I let the heat get any wider, it'll just be a wider, wider radius. So just a touch more heat. And then bend her down. You can get pretty good just by looking with your eye, but if you're not that good, grab yourself a square. You've got to be quick as soon as the heat's out. There we go, that's pretty 90 degrees. I'm happy with that. So the next thing is putting the other 90 degree band so it comes out like this so we can have a crank. Now there's a couple things we gotta think about. The distance that we have it come down before the next band is gonna affect how hard it is to crank. So if you make this only a one inch or something like that, it's gonna be kinda hard to actually do this, um, mind you, faster. And the longer you make this, it'll make it super easy to wrap the coil up, but um, you're gonna have to do a lot of hand cranking. So for me, I think a good six inch throw would be good. So I'm gonna measure down six inches from here, make a mark and then I gotta bend the 90. Now the next really crucial thing is that when we bend the 90, we ideally want this bend to be parallel with this, just so cosmetically it looks good and it doesn't look goofy. Uh, and the other thing is it has to be on the same angle, right? If we had it bent 90 like this, as opposed to same as that, then that'll look goofy too. So we have to watch that, how we set it up in the vise. So let's get that one bent now. Now another thing, when working with oxyacetylene gas, you should never put the flame or the torch or the heat on the vice jaws themselves because they have been hardened already. And so if you do that, you're gonna anneal them and take the heat out of it. Uh, so just make sure that your torch is kind of glancing off the top and then you'll be fine.
keep the heat moving, that way you don't kind of melt into the base metal. We want that nice tight band. We don't want a big, big hot area, otherwise you're just going to get a huge radius in a bend. Once it's got that glowing orange look all the way around the whole rod, you're ready to go. Give it just a touch more heat. So the very last thing we got to do is put a hole in here so that we can put our wire in and start wrapping it up when we turn the crank. Now I've got this positioned about an inch here and about an inch there. Handle kind of down and I'm just going to put about an inch away from here. Right on the side, a mark where I've got to do a center punch and drill that hole. So let's do that. When it comes to figuring out what size drill to put in your mandrel, you have to figure out what size wire you're using for your chain mail. So I'm using 16 gauge wire. This is galvanized stuff that I bought from Home Depot a while back. It is electric fence wire. And it comes in a quarter mile long on this roll. So this will last a long time. And the galvanized makes sure it doesn't rust, which is really quite cool too. Now, all you do is you measure the diameter of the wire and I would go 1 64th higher. Or if you got one of these drill gauges, just Put it on there until it goes in a hole and and for me it is 564 so i'm going to drill it 564 hole that's where gas welded chain mail making jig is now done wanted to paint it up you could but if you do I would just paint the frame and not the mandrel you'll find that as you use it it'll kind of keep any rust off it anyway but uh, the frame could definitely use a little bit of paint and when you're wanting to use this thing all you got to do is mount it in a vise or if you don't have a vise or you don't want to work on the vise you can always take a couple C clamps and mount it to the end of a table and then put your mandrel in get your wire and I like putting mine down on the ground kind of underneath and you find your hole and you put the 16 weight gauge wire in it. And I would recommend you have a glove for your left hand. That way as your right hand's cranking, you can put a little bit of pull or some tension on that wire to make sure that it's a nice tight coil as you're going along. And um, safety glass is not a bad idea, but it's more for later when you start cutting. All right, now take your time. This is a hand operated, right? So you can go as fast or as slow as you need to. Once you feel more comfortable, you can speed it up. So get it to turn around and the idea is that as you are turning, you want to wrap the next coil right next to the other one so it's nice and tight and just kind of follow it along. If it kind of doubles over on itself, just quickly back up, pull on it a little more and straighten it and just keep going. And then really as many rings as you want to make up to about here is, is how much you can make, so it's up to you. Now you can keep going until you get as many rings as you want to make and when you are done you just take a pair of diagonal side cutters that have the flat side here go ahead and trim that and then this thing is kind of trapped because this is through that hole that we drilled so what you have to do is find the spot where this is going into the hole and you got to clip it so you can pull that out and then to get this end out, you just basically push on the end here to kind of kick it up a bit and then just cut that off. And then slide your coil or your spring off with your mandrel. Now once you got your coil here, you're going to have to cut off the end that is straight. So start with a spot where you can see that it is definitely part of the nice curve. Make sure you got your safety glasses for these little things that fly off randomly and maybe into your eye. And then once you've got a nice circle coil there to start with, the trick is to use the flat side of a diagonal side cutting pliers to put against that last cut. If you have it too far back when you cut the next coil, you're going to end up with a gap. So right against there as much as you can and, and honestly even like a half mil overlap. I would only cut one ring at a time. Watch your fingers, you can cut, kind of put your hand around it like this and it kind of traps the ring so it doesn't fly off on you. 
And then you can see that it kind of does a little kind of twist in it. You can use your fingers and just straighten it back. So it's got a little bit of spring. So if you go like this and then it'll bounce back, what you're looking for is that it's ideally right in the same path. And if you've done it right, you end up with a ring with a extremely small gap. And it's kind of hard to see on the camera and I've zoomed it up as much as I can. The cut is kind of tapered, so there's like almost like the burr of the, the end of the cuts are practically touching, and that's what we're shooting for. That way these things don't fall apart as we start weaving our pattern. All right, some other chainmail making tips before you head on out of here is that when you are trying to weave your pattern with your chainmail rings, do not open up your chainmail ring like this. If you do that, you kind of distort the curve and you will never get it back and it will never be closed tight enough. So what you do instead is open it sideways stall it into your pattern and then close it that way just nice and side to side and um, remember you got to go past to get it to spring back so that it's nice and flush if you do it that way you can even kind of close up the gap even more so that's a really good trick and then the other one is you can do it with your fingers depending on how strong your fingers are but after a while it does get a bit hard so i would highly I uh, suggest that you invest in a pair of these jewelry pliers. And what's making them different is they're really quite tiny, so you can get into nice little tight chainmail weaves, and the inside of the jaws does not have any kind of serration, so we're not gonna leave any indents on our rings and damage them. All right, that's a wrap on another project video from Way of the Wrench and on how to become a welder. This time on how to make your own jig for making chainmail rings. And if you haven't tried making chainmail before, I highly recommend it. There's something soothing and calming about weaving those chainmail rings and putting it all together to make a cool project. And really, who doesn't want to make some medieval chainmail armor? I think that's pretty cool stuff. Um, so look forward to the future. I will have some chainmail making projects so that you can make something at home with this jig. And if you have any questions or concerns about what was going on in this video, just put them down below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. And until next time, take it easy.